it's it's more of a, a an amalgam of uh, uh, of personality and party driven politics. Mm -hmm. So so here are the basic. Uh, oh, and by the way, the threshold has increased over the years, which I frankly believe is really good. When it was a lower threshold, there were sometimes 15, 18, I think one Knesset, you know, 20 or 19 parties, just craziness. So now there's fewer. The threshold is uh, three and a quarter percent. So until you get that, you don't get a seat in the, in the Knesset. And just to make, I know this is a very savvy crowd uh, and that excites a teacher always, um, <laughs> but just to make sure, um, the Knesset is 120 seats, of course, and one needs um, <clears throat> 61, uh, one over half to um, uh, concoct the governing coalition. There's never been a party with um, 61 seats um, by itself. Uh, even in the in the heyday of Avodah, of labor, they always had to create a, a, a coalition. Um, so, so that's the, the broad backdrop. Here, here are the, here's an amalgam of the most recent polls. Likud, Bibi's party, quote unquote, um, the, um, the ancestor, uh, the descendant rather of uh, Herut, uh, the quote right wing party, that's a terrible term, but you know what I mean. Uh, Likud right now looks to get, get 30, 31, maybe 32 seats, uh, depending upon the poll you're looking at. The second largest party is Yesh Atid, relatively new, connected to Yair Lapid. Um, the, the most recent poll is 24 to 26, I call it an even 25. The Religious Zionist Party, 14. I'll just go through these quickly, then I'll go one by one. National Unity is 12. Shas, the Sephardi um, Haredi party, more or less, uh, eight. Uh, United Torah Judaism, uh, abbreviated in English, UT, UTJ, seven. Yisrael Beitenu, which is largely uh, former Soviets, uh, led by Avigdor Lieberman, six. Labor and Meretz, both are polling about five. And uh, the two Arab parties, the Hadash Ta'al and the joint list, uh, are both polling at four. So let's break them down. And then what, what I hope is we'll talk about, you know, so what does this all mean and the coalitions and everything else. So Likud, Bibi was the longest serving prime minister. Um, he, he is now the head of the opposition. Uh, he's going to try to win his sixth term as prime minister. Um, even his, the people who aren't thrilled with him and they are legion, uh, give him high, high points for economics. Uh, the most recent polls say that he's probably going to have a Likud, I don't want to personalize it too much, will probably have enough seats to form the coalition. In the last election, his coalition fell short. Um, so if you can remember, and it's hard to keep it in mind, in April to, uh, 2019, Likud um, had 60 seats, one less than they needed. Uh, to form a coalition by itself. March 2020, the next election, they talked a little, they hit 58 seats. So he shared um, power with Blue and White, the Polavan, that was headed by Benny Gantz. That coalition fell apart after seven months. March of 21, the coalition of opposites united in their, I'll just say, distaste of BZ. Um, uh, Bibi's nemesis, uh, Avigdor Lieberman was part of that, uh, Yisrael Beitenu, another political enemy, Gideon Sa'ar, in, in, in the New Hope Party. Both of them used to be allies. And one thing about Bibi, you could say he's strong in economics, uh, talk about his lineage. You can also talk about he's not great at keeping friends. Um, most of the, the closest allies he's had are now political opponents. So uh, uh, that counts for Avigdor Lieberman, that counts for Gideon Sa'ar as well. Uh, Bibi's got, let's just say, legal troubles. He's been indicted on three corruption charges, one for bribery, one for fraud, and one for breach of trust. Um, his, all, his credentials also on the right have been tarnished uh, over the years because he supported in 2005 the withdrawal from, uh, from Gaza. So he's slightly getting attacked, certainly from the left, somewhat from the right right, um, and the legal troubles are huge. 
let's go to Yesh Atid, um, the, um, and obviously I'll, I'll stop for questions too, but I want to give you an uh, overview. Yesh Atid is connected to uh, Yair Lapid, or Yair Lapid is connected to Yesh Atid. In 2012, it broke out of the, the uh, starting gates with 19 seats, huge. In the first year, uh, that, was, that was the first year that uh, Lapid entered politics. It was the second largest party in the Knesset. By 2015, by the next election, it dropped 11 seats. That's very typical. Um, a lot of you probably know a number of political parties in Israel. They're often connected with um, uh, you know, a celebrity, usually a general in the day. They flame out and then they, they, flame, they flame on, then they flame out. So this is very typical. Yeshati won 19 seats. It was the new guy in town. Three years later, it dropped to 11 seats. What's interesting is that Yeshati didn't go by the uh, board. It's really solidified its place in, in, in second, um, uh, which is both accredited to its philosophy and also to uh, Yair Lapid. Uh, Yair Lapid is kind of interesting. His dad was Tommy Lapid, the former mayor of, of uh, Tel Aviv, who was a, um, an enthusiastic secularist. Uh, Yair it was in, um, uh, in TV broadcasting for a number of years. Um, he's articulate, he's well-spoken. He doesn't come from military, and that's really unusual, or at least it used to be um, uh, in, in, in Israel. Um, Yair Lapid became prime minister in July through a power sharing agreement with Naftali Bennett. Um, he doesn't have a lot of time in office. He's really a caretaker right now. Um, so what he's been doing, he's met with international leaders. I think he met with President Biden, either his 12th or 13th day in office. Um, he's giving speeches. He just concluded successfully a very serious, very significant maritime border deal with Lebanon. Um, so that's to his credit. Um, his challenges are Bibi, who is, say whatever you want, a heck of a, a politician, and not necessarily in a good way, but he, he knows the game. Um, uh, and he's in, yeah, he is also uh, possibly challenged by his uh, coalition partners, Benny Gantz from Blue and White, and Gideon Sa'ar, who's now the Minister of Justice, they form national unity. So this is again, very typical. It's um, uh, the fourth Star Wars movies. Um, uh, they're in that little bathosphere in, in the water and Jar Jar is nervous that there's a fish eating the, the bathosphere. And then there's another one eating that one. And uh, uh, Qui-Gon Jinn says, there's always a bigger fish. And, and this is in Israeli politics, you know, one eats the other, eats the other. So, so right now, Yair Lapid is in second place, or, or sorry, Yishatid is, but they're being challenged both by the right and also by his former partners, by the national unity. Um, uh, Gantz and Sa'ar argue that Lapid won't be able to um, form a government without the Haredi parties. And that's really key. The Haredi parties, Shas and UTJ, uh, United Torah Judaism, really hold the linchpin. It's really, really rare. This last coalition did, but it's almost unheard of to form a government without the Haredi, without the quote, ultra-Orthodox. So that's his albatross. If he, if he gets the nod by the president to form a coalition, it's gonna be really tough mathematically to do that without the Haredi. So the next largest party is called the Religious Zionism Party. Um, it's headed by Bitzalel uh, Smotrich. Um, uh, so Bitzalel was raised Orthodox in Beit El in the quote unquote West Bank in the territories. Um, early on, he, he protested against the withdrawal from Gaza. Uh, so he made his bones that way. He's on record very early as saying mm, very, very negative things in Hebrew and in English about Arabs, about LGBT uh, uh, Jews, about reformed Jews. Um, in the last Knesset in 2015, not just the last, he was eighth on the list of the Jewish Home Party and the Jewish Home Party only won eight seats. So by the skin of his teeth, it, that, that's another thing I'm sure many of you know, the lists are created in priority order, right? So um, oftentimes a large party will, will put down as many uh, people in, in seat order as they believe they're going to uh, gain in the Knesset. And if you're sitting with number two or number three or number five, you look pretty good. If you're in a smaller party, 
and you've been given number seven or number 10 or number 12, you're probably not going to get in. So that was kind of a shtoch um, to, um, uh, to uh, Betzal el Smotra to give him some, number eight because they didn't even think they were going to get eight seats. They did. He got on uh, into the uh, Knesset. In 2019, he took on the leadership of the Takuma Party. Doesn't exist anymore. Bibi then appointed him Minister of Transportation, so he was in the government. His Twitter trade, uh, tirades are similar to, to former President Trump. They are all over the place. They're angry. Um, he goes after all kinds of people. In January of 21, about a year or so ago, before the March 21 elections, he renamed his party, the Religious Zionism Party, and he allied with a couple of people, uh, a couple of parties, Otsma Yehudi, um, Jewish Power, and the Noam Party um, uh, to form a larger bloc. Um, Noam is mostly social issues. They're anti-LGBT. Uh, Otsma Yehudit is about um, religious Zionism. Uh, the polling is that religious Zionism will probably get 14, maybe 15 seats. The other two parties might get six seats combined. Then we go to the National Unity, uh, Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz was an uh, IDF general, um, very, very well respected, and like a lot of generals, um, was better you know, in the military than he was in politics. Um, Ehud Barak is a, a former prime minister and a former uh, uh, chief of the IDF. Um, by all accounts, even those who aren't thrilled with him, he's literally a genius. He's a classical pianist. He's bright beyond bright beyond bright. But that doesn't mean you're great at politics, and he wasn't. Um, so he's hanging in there, um, um, uh, Benny Gantz, unlike uh, Ehud Barak. Um, uh, another thing, Ehud Barak used to be the BB's commander, and there was always a little rivalry there. Anyway, ben, Benny Gantz, head of the National Unity, in February of uh, 2019, he joined Yair Lapid's Yesh uh, and Moshe Ya'alon's Kelem to form Blue and White, uh, uh, with himself as the head. Uh, Blue and White tied with the food that year with 35 seats. Neither of them could form a coalition uh, government. So there was a snap election. Then Blue and White got 33 seats and Likud got 32. The president in Israel doesn't only have to give the, um, the party that wins the most seats uh, the nod to form the coalition. It's complicated, but in essence, the president can, it's one of the rare real powers the president have, and it's a big one. The president can do the math him or herself, I guess, theoretically, hasn't happened yet, um, and say, you know, you who got two seats fewer, I believe you can form a coalition more easily, you get the first shot, right? And then if they can't, it goes to the next one. So uh, so to uh, back up, blue and white uh, tied with Likud for 35 seats, in 2019, neither of them could form a coalition. There was another election, right? Blue and White got 33 seats, Likud got 32. Again, nobody could form a coalition. Then in the third election, Likud got 36, Blue and White got 33. And that was in March of 2020. So they jockeyed back and forth, back and forth. In some way, uh, Lahav deal, you could say Israel mirrors the, the US or mirrors a lot of other countries. It's really, polarized and it's not, it used to be, you know, you could count uh, easily that la labor is going to win handily. Uh, now, uh, you know, Likud and Yeshatid or, or the Likud block and the Yeshatid block are relatively even. And that's why there's so much power in the hands of the Haredi. Gantz decided to join Bibi in a national unity government when he couldn't um, make, form a coalition on his own. And Yeshatid and Tellem pulled out in protest uh, uh, for what uh, Blue and White was doing. Gantz um, was punked by Bibi. Uh, the agreement uh, was that Bibi would serve as prime minister for his 18 months. And then he'd say, oh, oh, uh, uh, now it's your turn, uh, honorable sir. And of course, hmm, that, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, it became clear that Bibi wasn't going to honor his agreement. So the coalition broke apart. The next election was in March of 21. Gantz only received eight seats. That's very typical, like I said. 
particularly with the military guys, with the generals. August, just a month or so ago of 2022, Gans formed a new party, the National Unity Party, with Gideon Sa'ar as new host. Um, uh, and a new player, the former IDF chief of staff, uh, Gadi Eisenfeld. Um, the polls say that they're probably going to hit 11 or 12 seats. Okay, now we get to one of my favorites just to watch, Shas. Shas is the um, Sparty uh, Haredi party, more or less. Remember, until um, uh, 77, Abu Dhabi ruled the roost. Right, labor and the Ashkenazim really had their, their thumbprint on Israeli politics. Um, with with Begin's election, Sfarim came into their own, and Shas has become a real power play player uh, since that time. So Arya Derry, um, uh, it's embarrassing. My spin on stuff like this, when I used to be the spokesperson for the community on Middle East matters. When people said, well, isn't the Jewish community embarrassed that this so-and-so was indicted and so-and-so is in jail? And I used to say, listen, um, a country is larger than an individual. What we should be proud of is no one's above the law. We've all heard that phrase, right? Um, so uh, Arya Derry was indicted and convicted for tax evasion. He was fined $50,000. Um, part of his plea bargain was he had to resign for the Knesset. But the but the plea bargain did not include that he could not run again, so uh, or even become minister in another government. So back up in '93, Derry was the Interior Minister. He was convicted of receiving $150,000 in bribes. The court sentenced him for, to three years in jail in 2000. He served 22 months. He was released for good behavior. In 20 elected, he returned to politics. In 2014, he submitted his resignation after a 2008 video emerged of Rabbi Obadja Yosef, who is the spiritual leader of the Sephardi community, called him a thief and a bad man. Um, in March of 2015, Gary returned, returned to politics and was interior minister from 2016 all the way to 2021. Mostly, Shas is concerned with funding of their own community. So their chief issue is funding their schools, funding their, their um, uh, synagogues through a, a complicated measurement um, and, and funding other issues in the Shas community. Um, the next one is United Torah Judaism, uh, Moshe Gafin. That's the Ashkenazi uh, Haredi party. Their main issue is very similar to Shas. They want funding for its community. Um, Gafni, on the other hand, has another problem. He's on record of saying he has problems with the state. A lot of us that teach uh, Israel and Zionism, we talk about the state, the land, and the people of Israel. He speaks about the people and the land. He decidedly talks about Eretz uh, uh, Israel, but not Medinat Israel. Medinat Israel is the modern nation state of Israel. Why? He's not thrilled about the Western Wall Agreement, even though <clears throat> that hasn't really happened. He's not thrilled with um, same-sex marriage, and he's not thrilled with other things that the Supreme Court, really, it should be the High Court of Justice, <clears throat> has has ruled on. So, um, for many in the Zionist camp, uh, that's that's really a bridge too far. But for for most of the the followers of the United Torah Judaism, that's okay. Shas and com Shas combined with UTJ are probably going to hit fifteen, maybe even sixteen seats. So they are a reliable support for Bibi's coalition in return for funding for their communities. Oh, by the way, not just funding, often they get uh, prime uh, ministerial positions. And, and if it sounds like horse trading, it is the epitome of horse trading. It's like we used to have the back room, smoke filled rooms here. They don't even do it in the back room. Everyone knows. And it's, it's kind of gross if you believe that politics can be a good force. Um, and, but it's really bald faced and it's out there. The next strongest party is Yisrael Beitenu, Avigor Lieberman, mostly made of uh, <clears throat> former Soviets. So that's important. Former Soviets are um, uh, anti communist. Um, they're, they're not too trusting of government, uh, they're not too trusting of religion. Um, so uh, that's how they vote. He was once an ally of Bibi. In 2018, he left the government. He was upset with the ceasefire with Hamas. So 
uh, on the most part, their party is, um, quote, right wing on security, on foreign policy, on economics, but actually closer to left wing, left uh, wing on uh, religion and state issues and social issues. So it's a complicated mix. Um, uh, this year, Lieberman called BB, I had to translate it, I wasn't sure the Hebrew, scum of the human race. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, uh, he's also anti Haredi. He calls the Haredim an existential threat and uh, like uh, Khomeini in Iran. Um, in 2009, uh, uh, Lieberman's party uh, was the height of its power, had 15 seats. Now they'll probably hit seven seats. All right, then we go to labor. Labor is, you know, the phrase um, that David said uh, in the Tanakh, how the mighty have fallen, speaking about Jonathan and Saul. Um, so how the mighty have fallen. Labor used to be, you know, the, the pinnacle. Right now, they'll, they'll be lucky to get five seats, five, maybe even six, which is up from the last Knesset. They were down to four. Um, in 2021, they had seven seats. Um, uh, they had been four, and most a lot of pundits said they're, they're going to be out completely. So they're hovering around five to six right now, but they're not a serious player. They'll have to join a coalition. Um, a lot of people, old guard, uh, hell, myself included, where you know, people really thought very, very highly of labor, um, uh, but they had a series of mishaps and, and probably not the best leaders, also. Next, and we're moving toward the left, is Meretz. Meretz is, you know, the the um, uh, the, the old guard um, left uh, party. Uh, it's even a question whether it can be considered a, a Zionist party. The Havad uh retired from politics, came back. Um, the polls this year say that they'll probably hit five seats. Um, uh, there's a question whether she said it should be a Zionist party. Um, she's on record of saying there, that's an open question. Then she was on record with, in an interview saying, no, of course it is. So it's, it's questionable. And then the two Arab parties. Ra'am is the United Arab List, uh, uh, led by Mansour Abbas, no relation to Mahmoud Abbas. Um, in 2021, a huge thing happened. It broke away from the joint list and joined the government coalition for the very first time. That's why people on the right some people, I shouldn't say people, some people said, oh, that government's not even Zionist. It has an Arab party in, in their government, in their coalition. Uh, a decidedly, by definition, non-Zionist party, first time ever. Um, other people said, wow, this is um, a good thing. Israel is now represented by a coalition of its entirety, of its citizenship. Um, there's probably 19 to 20, maybe 21% of Israel citizen uh, self-identify as Arab. Now, uh, we're, we're not talking about <clears throat> um, uh, Palestinians in the territories in Yudah and Shamam in the West Bank. Uh, you have to be careful about the nomenclature. We're talking about um, uh, Arab citizens, about 20%. The other Arab party is Abash Ta'al, uh, led by uh, Ayman Oded and Ahmad Tibi, old time uh, Arab politicians. Um, that's the remainder of the joint list. They'll probably hit four seats approximately. Um, they're really angry at uh, uh, Abbas pulling away from the joint list. They lost a lot of power. They were not happy with him uh, or, or Ra'am joining the coalition either philosophically. Then there are parties that just haven't made the threshold and probably won't. You know, obviously the election isn't uh, yet, uh, but uh, probably won't. That party, chief amongst them, is the Jewish Home Party. Ayelet Shaked is the leader of the Jewish Home Party. It's under the three and a quarter threshold, but it is gaining. It's quote right wing. Um, uh, joining the it, it joined the coalition the last time, but it joined a coalition <clears throat> with an Arab partner. So that angered her base. Since that, she's apologized. She recanted. She actually said something that many politicians don't say, um, she made a mistake. Um, and she would not do that again if it was uh, uh, up to her. Her platform includes the death penalty for terrorists and a capitalist economy. Um, there is another party called Balad, uh, also uh, not polling above the threshold, uh, Sami uh, Abu Shahadeh, 
is the um, uh, is the leader of the party. It also pulled away from the joint list, um, decided to run alone without other air parties. It's scoring about 1% now in the polls, so it won't get into the Knesset. Um, but interestingly, not getting into the Knesset will, in a weird way, strengthen the odds of a right-wing coalition being formed because it won't be able to add its seat to a left-leaning coalition. Um, September 27th, the Israeli Central Elections Committee disqualified, disqualified it from running because it called for the negation of the Jewish state and for Israel to become a state for all its citizens. The high court overruled the ruling of the Israeli Election Committee. So uh, theoretically, it could join the coalition, uh, join the government, uh, Knesset, but it probably won't even get enough state. Uh, enough seats. So I, I want to go into a few issues and some personalities and obviously see if there's questions. You may have been reading about uh, Itamar Ben Gvir. Um, the Jewish News, a leading a, a newspaper in, in the British uh, Jewish uh, community, um, uh, had a lead article, I think just two days ago, said it wants to know why diaspora Jews are not more outraged over the rise of far-right Israeli politicians like Ben Gvir. So Ben Gvir will probably, has, has already technically joined the religious Zionism party, anti-Arab, anti-gay, um, anti-non-Orthodox Jew, um, openly praises Baruch uh, Goldstein, uh, the, the one who uh, uh, executed the, the massacre in Tavron in uh, 1994. Um, so the question is, how does the diaspora respond or does it? He's really called, I think, I, I think with, with reason, a Kahanist uh, after Meyer Kahana. Um, as an attorney, he defended two Jewish extremists who were charged in the 2015 arson attack on uh, Duma, a Palestinian uh, village. Um, so that's an open question. I'll leave that to the side. Um, here are the possible results. Um, not just the numbers, gridlock. Almost for sure, for sure, there's gonna be gridlock because it's gonna be really tough for any of the lead parties to form a coalition. The religious Zionism party, the one now being tagged by them with Ben Gvir, uh, is increasing its size. Mostly its votes are probably coming from Likud. So it's not going to add to the numbers on the right. If it was pulling people away from, say, labor or merits or yeshatid, it would make the right stronger. But there's no way that's going to happen. So in some way, they're just kind of trading votes. The coup to the religious Zionist party or vice versa doesn't help the coalition. Um, what's probable is that the Likud and their allies will hit 60 or 59, uh, and yeshatid block is going to be far smaller, maybe 25, maybe 30, if they keep the Haredim out. If they keep the Haredim in, then they'll hit a much larger number. So here are some possibilities. If Bibi's coalition does get one or two seats more, it's able to form a coalition. Uh, Smotrich and, and Ben Gvir on the, I'll say far right, are likely to propose a law making it harder to prosecute politicians for corruption, which might kill any chance of Bibi going to trial. If Lapid falls short of his 61, which is likely, but if he keeps BB away from his 61, he stays as caretaker prime minister, yet you're Lapid, until a new election is called probably in three or four months. And then the question is, what can he do in those three or four months? So here's the strategy in, in some of the parties. The Likud, in the last couple of weeks, I'm reading the Israeli papers, the American, the Brit papers, um, uh, Aris, uh, others um, in the, the pollsters, Likud is trying harder and harder um, uh, to increase the voter turnout. Uh, they think um, there's been voter fatigue, which is absolutely true. People are tired of, of even the people who believe blue and white are just saying, Nimashlikvar, forget it, I'm tired, it's not helping any. And so they're worried about a much smaller turnout. If Likud can turn up the, the percentage of turnout, it'll probably um, uh, bode well for them. Yishatid is trying to increase not just turnout, but the Arab bloc turnout. The polls say Arabs are now gonna vote maybe 40%, 
very, very low for uh, Israelis, the lowest in years. If it stays low, that'll help BB. If it increases, it'll probably help uh, Yeshati. Um, and number one, uh, uh, Yair Lapid wants to make sure that he keeps Yeshati as at least the second largest party, even if he doesn't get to form the coalition, because then he gets to be the, the loyal opposition. Okay, that was a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm sorry, I don't have a whiteboard and, and drawing air, arrows and circles. Um, uh, let's see, number one, was that semi-intelligible? Do you have questions about the shot, about the numbers and this? And then let's talk about strategy and, and where the elections probably go from here. Um, jump up and down, unmute yourself, do that silly little hand thing, whatever you want. What about the Arabs? It seems to me um, it's almost like the Arabs versus the off the uh, Shas and, and similar parties that they seem to indirectly control the election. So um, yeah, indirectly is a, a good adverb to use. If if they they go in in larger numbers, it, it won't. If they go in larger numbers and if they agree to sit in a coalition, yes, they can do a lot of things. But the last time they did that, it was the first time and the last time so far, um, the Arab leaders got a lot of flack for that. So it's a huge question whether even if they pull high, whether they are going to join a coalition. If they do not, they're telling Yeshav T, you have no chance of building a coalition unless you go to the Haredi. So in a weird way, the Haredim and the Arabs are polar <coughs> opposites and are in some way, they're both kingmakers uh, because the other two largest parties are too evenly matched, even though Likud has more. So yeah, the Arab parties have huge power and so do the Haredim. Uh, somebody, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. I'm pointing at the screen like you know who I'm pointing to. How, how does a party get to be on the ballot. I'm sorry, how does a party or a ah, okay. group Thank you. or a person get on the ballot in the first place? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um uh it's actually not that complicated or not that hard. Um the, the hardest part right now is they have to it it's a um uh an amalgamation of I think right now six of the major polls. And you have to, you, the threshold has to be right now three and a quarter. If you poll, if your party polls uh, three and a quarter percent or more of the total voting population, um, you'll get one seat for every um, a percentage point that you poll. So that's how you get in uh, to the Knesset. How you get into the ballot uh, is, is you have to show a certain amount of support in the in the uh, in the country, uh, uh, um, what's it called when when uh, new when when you're getting a voter voter turnout? So it's the same thing as in the states. Um, almost anybody can put a party together. That's why in the past there have been parties. Let's see, there's been the um, liberal marijuana party. There's been a party uh, solely focused on um, women's issues. There's been a party uh, for the Sfaradim. Um, uh, uh, obviously for former Soviets. Oh, there's been an attempt at a party for former Ethiopians. So there's a lot of single issue parties that have gotten onto the ballot, but they they flamed out because they didn't hit the threshold. Jerry, uh, uh, I had a question. Go ahead, Jerry. So I did a little bit of pre-reading to kind of prepare for this a little bit. And I was trying to find out information on Netanyahu's trial. And most of the information I found was that it's delayed and delayed, but it's not officially delayed, but he wants it delayed till after the election, except it's not delayed. Uh, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on what effect this trial does or doesn't have uh, in terms of my impression anyway, is that some of the relatively large parties are existing to some degree as anti-Netanyahu parties. And Likud apparently doesn't have the stomach to try to get rid of him because the most recent attempt at that fizzled rapidly. So with that yeah. 
with that statement of what the background seems to be, unless you want to correct me, because I'll, I'll admit that I'm just reading uh, a handful of articles, and I'm sure you're reading more. Uh, what effect do you think that this trial does or doesn't have on Likud's prospects and whether there's any chance that some of these allegedly anti-Netanyahu parties that somehow went to bed with him anyway, uh, like Blue and White, which was never going to be in coalition with Netanyahu until they were, um, is that kind of horse trading likely or is, or, or yeah. another election? So I'll preface it by, by um, uh, remembering when I was in uh, graduate school for um, uh, international relations and <clears throat> Middle East uh, politics. I used to be envious when they, uh, when they uh, got to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria. I thought, oh man, it's so easy just having one party. Uh, you, you know, it, 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 you don't have to think, you don't have to say, oh, the polls say such and such. And I, I used to laugh. Oh, look at that! Turnout's ninety-eight percent. How wow! This again? How do you like that? Uh, and and that that was even in an easier time. Um, now you know it. It's look, look. It's democracy on steroids. It's it's a wonderful thing, and we all are frustrated. And those our uh, closest closest friends, and now our daughter in Israel, are completely frustrated. The silver lining is, boy, if you want to see democracy in action, you, you go to Israel. So um, I, I think the trial is hitting both ways. I just read something from um, Yidiot, which is kind of a, a mainstream, eh, it, it, it leans teeny bit to the right, it's centrist more or less, uh, certainly not left. Um, uh, and then another one, Haaretz, which does lean uh, to the left uh, uh, clearly, um, but they both agreed that, that Bibi trying to delay this um, is uh, one, it's smart and he's really good at that stuff um, uh, before the election. Two, um, it's, it's absolutely playing uh, into his strength uh, because as David said, the people on the right, the other people in Likud, th there's nobody who can challenge him. Every time somebody rears his head, it's almost always a his. Um, in, like we would say here, they get primary except there's no real primary, but he, his people, man, go to town and they, they, they are really, really good at tarring and feathering anybody that comes close to, um, uh, uh, um, to challenging Bibi for the throne. So if he stays out of jail, I don't think anybody's going to be able to do that. Um, even the Likudnikim are on record of saying, man, he's not something, when you shake your hand, his hand, count your fingers after you leave, but we still want him in power. Uh, so it, staying out of uh, these trials until after the election serves him well. The other thing is, like I said, if he gets in and if his coalition wins, Smotrich and Ben Gavir are already on record saying one of the first laws that they'll promulgate in the Knesset will be to make it much more difficult to prosecute a politician specifically for corruption. Gee, I wonder why. They're gonna try to completely wipe out the possibility of him being tried. It's, uh, it's diabolical. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Sheila, and then, what, yeah, go ahead. What if, I mean, come on, they're Jews. Why don't, why doesn't someone like Gantz or some of the other uh, parties just accept Netanyahu for now and tell him we will join you if you kick out the Shas or who you know whichever the most orthodox and obnoxious group is and that way they will have a chance whenever Netanyahu gives up to get into the government what they're doing is that they're they're just destroying the whole government and instead of taking a chance in other words let Phoebe win Give him what he wants now. You know, extract what you want, but we don't want Chas and the other. And it's what's the other one? Is it mainly um, Chas? Uh, UTJ United. Yeah. Board in other board. words, you you kick them out. We'll come with you. You can do sort of what you want, but you know, give us say some ministers, so, so, and eventually we you know we'll take over. We can take over. Okay, so I, I would say to that. 
Um, BP doesn't have a great track record at honoring his agreements. So this, this did happen, exactly that, a power sharing agreement uh, where he was gonna serve his 18 months and <clears throat> Gantz was gonna come in after that. No, no, uh, no, 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 I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about sharing. Give up on the sharing. In other words, oh, you're letting, in other, you're giving up on sharing and hoping in five, 10 years, you can get to be the prime okay. minister. So, so look- You can't I, do it any other way. Yeah, look, that's, that's that's a reasonable calculus. You just have to the 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 issue is um, how much are you in agreement and how much are are you in disagreement with him? If you think security is the number one issue in Israel, which it almost always is, uh, you could say short term he actually did a good job at keeping Israel out of wars for the most part, and when there were, they were relatively short lived. If you think long term and you ascribe to the notion that Israel's security for the long term <clears throat> has to have some kind of a deal with Palestinians, whatever that looks like, then you could make the argument that Likud's positions are actually not helpful. They're helpful short term, but not long term. So it all depends how, how strongly you feel about that and how strongly you feel about that versus how strong do you feel about the Haredim and their influence? The polls in Israel are really clear. The vast, vast majority of Israelis are fed up to here with the Haredim, not Orthodox, don't confuse the two, right? And there are even breakaway, break small, but breakaway um, Hasidim who are serving in the IDF, Kol HaKavod, good for them, or serving in other units, not in the military, but national service. That's amazing, that's wonderful, but a teeny tiny drop, you know, a tipa. Um, but if you think that they're hurting Israel's um, uh, national psyche by not serving, if you think that it, they're adding to corruption because of all the money being funded uh, to the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the rabbinate um, and to their, their institutions, you have to weigh that and Gantz and Yeshatid uh, uh, and Meretz and Labor are so fed up with those issues, they won't get into bed with Bibi. Um, uh, so the other parties, even, even Avigdor Lieberman, who can't stand the guy, call him what I say, scum of the earth or scum of the human race, he might even hold his nose and join a coalition. He's saying he's not. But because for him, security, national security is the most important beyond those other issues. So it, look, it depends. And the problem is that the polls are so even, the people who are upset with um, quote, social issues are also concerned with security issues. It's very different from the states. Even people quote on the left, they understand what it means to give up territory, except for the far left merits, which is almost, 100% in agreement to give up uh, much, much of the West Bank. Um, but even they say, of course, we need a, a viable, sustainable Jewish state. Um, the others are saying, watch yourself. If we give up territory, um, we know what that means. We know the risk. So they're not, they're not naive. So it's, it's, they're between a rock and a hard place. If Bibi's the only guy on the right, right now it looks like it, you know, uh, Smotrich is, is just not palatable to most people in Israel and Ben Gavir even less so. There's nobody else to challenge the guy. And he's 70-ish, uh, uh, 71, whatever. He's viable, he's vital, he's young enough, he, whatever. He doesn't eat like our Sharon used to. He's in, I mean, he's not in great shape, but he's not gonna keel over. He's gonna be around for a long time still. So they don't know how to challenge him. If the left doesn't get enough votes on their own, um, they're looking at either power sharing or BB as prime minister again. Or if he goes to jail, then the right will have to find somebody new. Uh, Joseph. Yes. Joseph, uh, you're muted. Yossi, you're still muted. You're muted in Hebrew, you're muted in English. There. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, they break in, breaking away. You know, since Golden Meir, I never heard anybody talking like Sheila. We should, she should go out for office. But beside that, beside that, okay, Sheila, that's well deserved. Another question is, from your experience, you said if there's a big turnout of voters, it favors who? It favors Bibi? If so a the big larger, turnout. Yeah, if the Arabs stay home, the larger turnout will probably favor Bibi. Uh, the more that the Arabs come okay. out, a lot more, it'll probably favor Yeshatu. What do you think from you talking to people? Because I'm not too much into it. It's been already five elections and God knows how many more. People are tired. Uh, the question is, what do you think this election is going to be a big turnout or a lot of people don't care anymore? They're, they're tired. They're, like I said, voter fatigue. Uh, you know, I, I shouldn't use Naomi, our, our daughter, but, but she's here. She's 26, <clears throat> um, served in the army, became an officer. She's in law school. Her chevra are from her garden. It was a, it's a, it's a Dati garden. Um, uh, very, very patriotic, serious people. Um, uh, they're, they're all going to vote, but they've, they've all told her, and she's even told us, and she knows that to Debbie and me, it's like one of the worst things you can tell us is you're not going to vote, no matter where you live, uh, and all the more so in Israel. She said, I'm not going to vote. I'm going to vote. I don't know if I'm going to vote again. You know, like They're tired. And so a lot of people are just completely fed up. And, and if, they, they, if they vote again, and it's still gridlocked, Yellow, uh, you know, sometimes the voter turnout is 65, 67, even uh, one time 69 or so percent. Amazing for Western democracy. The polls are showing that it's going to be less and less. The Arab vote alone is going to be probably 40 percent, 40, 42 um, percent. That's terrible for democracy. You know, gridlock, uh, everyone likes gridlock because it means that no one party can run in one direction or another. But gridlock also steals our enthusiasm for democracy. So uh, it, it's really worrisome. Yeah, Other, uh, uh, yes, Sherry, yes. Go ahead. Is that Sherry? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, um, uh, I read it in the Jewish Telegraph Agency that Defense Minister Benny Gantz uh, will not work with with Netanyahu uh, or Likud at all. He will not go, join any coalition with him. And uh, Yair Lapid said that he would work with Likud, but not with Netanyahu at the head. So, just wanted so, to make those. So, so I like I said, if I had my whiteboard, what I would be doing, I've done this in, in other presentations, you draw a dotted line this way, uh, and then you cut that one, because this one will work with that one, that one will not work with that one. And by the way, it's very typical in Israeli elections before most of the key players are on record of saying, I'll never work with him, I'll put you on that guy, he, he's a Sputnik, and then magically, oh, look at that, they, they join the coalition. That happens more times than not. So I wouldn't put money on somebody saying, I'll never, I'll never, because for the most part, look, Gantz had said that before, Ehud Barak said that before, uh, in the day, Moshe Dayan said that, um, um, uh, a lot of people, very few stood their ground. Uh, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, they said they weren't going to work with so-and-so, and they didn't. But for the most part, almost everybody I can think of, major players, have, have gone back and forth. Back. Here, look at Ari Derry. Unbelievable. The guy's indicted. He pays a fine. He joins the government. He says, I'll never, I'll join that one. He says, I'll never, I'll join that one. Uh, so I'm not sure you can trust the people who say, I'm not going to do that. Oh, hmm. somebody put on the chat, uh, if you're not speaking, please mute because it's getting some feedback. Thank you. Any other uh, questions at all? I wanted to spend just a minute or so on the maritime agreement. It's really exciting. Yeah, Sheila? Yossi, please mute. Yossi, please mute. What's that? Now you're muted. 
there is one other interesting thing that we're not we're completely forgetting, and that is if a boss in the Palestinian ever you know leaves office and in any which way this could influence the government of Israel. Uh -huh, yeah, 100%. So that is the one thing that I mean is old enough that it might Yassi, Yassi, it's your machine. Turn it on. Turn the mute. What? Mute. It's your yeah, machine. If you can mute, making yeah, that thank noise. you. Okay. okay. So, Sheila, go ahead. Repeat what you said because I don't know if everyone heard it. Simply the uh, elephant in the room <laughs> is Abbas or whoever, whatever happens in the uh, in Palestine. That could change, you know, on a dime. That can change the whole thing, whether it's Netanyahu or anybody else. So, so that so, is probably right. the only way we're going to have some kind of solution to the government and stop having so many elections. And for the most part, um, the PA has made some uh, inroads. I inroads is too strong. Uh, overture is better with uh, to uh, Hamas. Uh, and they're, look, they're deadly, deadly enemies. Um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, also known as Abu Mazen, um, you know, wants nothing to do with Hamas. Um, but in the last two weeks, maybe three weeks, there's been a few open communiques that they've released to the press saying they'd like to, you know, um, uh, coalesce. Um, it, it's obviously Israel's nightmare. Um, thank God, you know, Israel's enemies um, can't stand each other. You know, the the uh, you know, the real nightmare scenario is the Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south actually talk to each other and coordinate. It would be awful if the PA, the uh, Palestinian Authority, and, and Hamas get together. That would be terrible. Um, if that happens politically, Israel um, has a, a history of forming national unity governments when they're really, really, uh, you know, uh, endangered. That might be, it also might, it probably would bode well for Bibi because people, you know, it's that whole thing about uh, uh, people trusting the right to keep us safe, but, uh, you know, they're the ones that the quote unquote Nixon goes to China or our, our Sharon is the only one who can withdraw from Gaza. People don't trust people on the left uh, to quote, give up or to show weakness. Those are broad generalized terms, but they trust people quote on the right to do that. The problem is most people don't trust Bibi at all, um, uh, but he's he's you know he's the one that we have. So you're right. If the Palestinians um, either uh, exert um, you know open violence, or if they show that they're getting um, uh, uh, in agreement with Hamas, that would probably bode well for Bibi. Um, let me just spend a, a couple minutes on this new agreement. It's very exciting and, and it's really good for Israel, good for Lebanon also, which is also good for Israel. The Israel-Lebanon Maritime Agreement, it has to do with a little over 300 square miles in the Mediterranean. The United States helped to broker it, so that, that's a good thing. It's a compromise, um, like all good agreements. Um, contested waters are gonna be divided by a line straddling um, a natural gas field called the Kana field. Um, it de-escalates the tension between Israel and Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon's barely a state, you know, it's really uh, ruled by Hezbollah uh, anyway and Amal and other parties, but, but it is at least technically a state. It also provides additional energy to Lebanon. Lebanon is a basket case, you know, after their own civil war years ago. Um, so it's one of those countries that has just a few hours of uh, energy during the nighttime and sometimes not even that. You could say, oh, so what? But when people are upset, they become unstable, they look for enemies, and they usually look for external enemies. So to the extent that the Lebanese can calm down even a little bit, if they're given more energy, it's a good thing for them, but it also promotes stability for Israel as well. Um, Hezbollah has grudgingly accepted, or at least said they're not going to negate the agreement, which is huge. So this is historic. It's also, as you might uh, understand, it's not just about energy and natural gas and, and money and that's all good and energy that's all good. Politically, it's a tacit recognition by Lebanon of Israel's existence. 
you might say, uh, guys, Israel's been around for a long time now. Doesn't matter. If they sign an agreement, they are signing that the other signatory is not the Zionist entity. The other signatory is the modern nation state of Israel. So it's a huge thing for Lebanon to do that. Israel has, has, has agreements, you know, initially with Egypt and then with Jordan and then through the Abraham Accords, um, <clears throat> other countries. But having another agreement with a contiguous Arab neighbor, that's huge. So it's a win-win-win, a win for the states, you know, for the role they played, a win for Israel, a win for Lebanon. And I'd say in a minor way, a win uh, toward, if not peace, um, toward the path of peace. Okay, that's... 527. Oh, it's 527 by me. It's 827 by you. Um, thank you so much. We've got three other sessions. Uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, Iran uh, and and then the Abrahamic Accords uh, and then Israel's relation with the great powers, primarily the United States, but also with Russia. Uh, Israel has not closed its doors, even with Ukraine, with Russia, and it's, it's ties with China as well. So that's the last session. Anyway, it's great to see everybody, even if it's just on a screen, everyone should be well. Uh, thank you so much for, for uh, coming to, to, to study.